Welcome to the, whoa, that was loud, Turing the Tips of the Week series. I am your host, Socrates, Matt Kulikondas, and John Cohen as not Socrates. Tip the 77th, temporaries, moves, and copies. So, Crates, I got an argument with Telemachus about whether or not my API is efficient. First of all, it's Socrates, and what's going on? Uh, I, can't, I can't figure out whether this API forces extra copies or not. Does Telemachus have an identical twin? No. What? I don't think he does. I'm just wondering. Tell me about this code. Uh, well, it makes vector events pretty efficient. How do you know? Well, it does it by an output parameter, so I don't even have to think about copies or moves at all. Being intellectually lazy is awesome. Fair enough, but what about this code? Oh, I mean, you make a copy in the next line. How do you know? Well, you're, you're just making another variable, copy it over. Well, then how about this code? I mean, you're making a string, and then you copy it into the map. So the string has a twin. I mean, yeah, what's going on? Nothing. These were easy, right? Yeah. I mean, this is getting kind of boring, to be honest. So what about this code? Well. That's just got the name return value optimization, right? Like, it doesn't do any copies or any moves at all, so... Your compiler might do that, but what's required in the language? What does the language say must happen? Uh, well, you got a vector. I guess you got to copy it out, but that doesn't seem right. Indeed. Ret has no twin. What's, what are you getting on with this twin business? <sighs> Do we ever have more than one name referring to the data in the vector? Well, we've got ret inside the function, and we've got foo outside the function, so I guess there's only ever one name at a time. Indeed, the language knows that the same data is never referenced at the same time, so it can move from the vector into the destination vector. Ah, wait, 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 okay, wait, can you put those other examples back? Okay, so the first one is a copy because there's two move, or two names, bar and foo. Exactly. But the second one, you just call it 42, that, but that's still a copy. Be careful here. Didn't we assign the string into a map? We did. So isn't the data also named map sub 5? <sighs> yeah, I guess it is. If I say map 5, I get the string back. And there you have it. If there's two names for the data, it's a copy. If there's one name for the data, it's a move. No, 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 let me have this clicker. What about temporaries? There's no name for that one. There's no need for the runtime to keep track of the data from two different names, is there? No. So we're forced to come to the same conclusion as for one name, yes? Yeah, I guess so. Now here's the real issue. You aren't even asking the correct question. What do you mean? Don't you care about efficiency? Of course we do. But the real question is, do we ever need output parameters? Well, <sighs> name counting is simple, right? Yeah, oh yeah, I can do it, yeah. And using value semantics makes intent clearer to both humans and the compiler, you would agree? Yeah, I'd have to. And compilers optimize better when they don't need to do complicated proofs involving pointer aliasing? Maybe. So we don't need to use output parameters? No, 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 you're wrong there, Socrates, because what about functions that have lots of return out values? No, I haven't forgotten. We have structured bindings now in C++. So now we can work in value semantics without having to worry about efficiency losses. Awesome, cool. That means that I was right, so I'm going to go tell Telemachus. Wait, does he have a twin? Uh, is there something else you're going to go and teach me? I don't think he does, but 
he's moving right towards us. Better go tell him yourself, because oh. I don't want to do this whole bit again. No, 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 no. That's not Telemachus. That's Zeno. He's never going to make it here. Tips the 88th, 1 12th, and 1 42nd. Initialization. What is the essence of a type? What? What is the essence of a type? Oh, all right, I got you, I got you. Scalability, object orientation, and Sphine. Just stop. The, the, those are just technologies and buzzwords. What is the essence of a type, the ideal form to which all types must follow? I, this is all Greek to me. What are you talking about? <sighs> Let me show you an example. What is the essence of this it, type? It's, it's a point on the plane. And how about this type? I'm here to code, not to philosophize. Well, unfortunately, you're having a conversation with a philosopher who's above you on the org chart. So answer my question. <laughs> Describe the ideal form of a line. It's, it's two points. You're on the right path, but let's dig deeper. You told me what a point 2D type represents, but what is its essence? What is it composed of? OK, it's got two coordinates one for the x-axis and one for the y-axis. But that's, that's really what it is, though. Like, a point is just an x-coordinate, y-coordinate. Yes, and what about our line over here? It's the same essence. It's just two points instead of two doubles, but, like, who cares? Is a point versus a double, it's all the same. Your mind has failed you again. This happens a lot for you, but don't worry. The line has infinite points. We can't just represent it. We can just represent it with two points. So in this case, a line's, a line's representation is different than its essence. It's more complex than a simple aggregate, like a point. Okay, okay, I see your point, but what is the essence of this tangent? <laughs> you read my mind. We should think about uniform initialization. Oh, uniform initialization is lit. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, one, one, exclamation point. The uniform syntax, so much nicer. It's not so simple, though. The syntax isn't as uniform as we'd like it to be. I mean, yeah, like, int's got some weird constructors, like, whatever. <sighs> Would you say a vector's essence is just an aggregate of items? <sighs> well, no, I mean, I guess not. It's a resizable random accent sequence of items. And yet, brace initialization mirrors aggregate initialization. We're actually calling a constructor when we mean to be just specifying some stuff that's in the vector. What about copy initialization? Well, I mean, so crazy, that doesn't even compile. Exactly! Because that constructor's marked explicit. The initializer list constructor isn't, though. So because the init list constructor is just jamming stuff into the vector, as opposed to calling any constructor, like, and it looks like brace initialization, so it's really easy to use, but because the other one's calling a constructor and it's marked explicit, but there's no name there, so using the copy initialization also makes explicit work. Just so, but there's more. How about this piece of code? What? I, is it aggregating characters? N no, it can't, it can't. Those are Kant's char, Kant's char stars. So it must be calling a const, oh my god, they're iterators. It's trying to make a range between the two Kant's char stars and it's super undefined behavior. That's unfortunate. How would you react to seeing something like this in a code? Oh, I'd hate it. You can't even tell that's a constructor. Like, what, what is this even? So we should distinguish initialization, which is just aggregation, versus initialization with more logic to it at the call site. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come here. All right, how about this? How about this? Okay, so 
when we're just doing a simple aggregation, when the type is, is representation is its essence, then we use assignment syntax with brace initialization. But if we're doing a constructor that has some more logic to it, use traditional constructor syntax, and that makes this weird vector nonsense a lot easier to find. Yes, but what about when those syntaxes aren't available? How might we best call these functions? I don't, I don't see your point, like that. You're constructing a line and point just as inter intermediate values. Let's see if we can make this less verbose. Okay. That's definitely less verbose, but how are we supposed to compute the slope of an undefined line? You know, I missed that one, but I bet we probably should have followed the rules from before and used a constructor call there. Now it's really obvious that we're making a line that doesn't exist. We agree on that. What if our line had another constructor for making a line through the origin given a slope? Well, we definitely mark it explicit because we don't want to, that line to compile and make something weird. So you did learn something in the academy after all. But this must be at least C++11 by now. We are modern programmers. Explicit has always worked for multi-arg constructors, but was never needed before. Explicit for multi-arg constructors. Oh, so I bet it keeps that weird brace initialization thing from compiling earlier. It does. We always want compilers to find the problems before we get a chance. Humans miss things more often. So now, what are the different ideal forms of initialization? Okay, okay, so when we're initializing a type where we're just aggregating, or the representation of the type is just the same as what it is, then we just use brace initialization syntax and copy, and copy initialization. But when a type or a constructor is not the same as its essence, when we have more logic going on, we want to use uh, traditional constructor syntax and mark all of the constructors explicit, even the ones with multi-args that, that are doing something more than just aggregating. Fantastic. Unfortunately, I have to go now. Plato went spelunking and he hasn't come back for days. Again. I'm gonna go try to find him. As, as an exercise, consider the implications of a type on the use of pushback and in placeback. Anybody? Anybody? All right, I got this, I got this. So, when we have a vector of a type where the type is its own essence, then we can really easily use pushback or in placeback because we know, like, if this was a vector of ints, in placeback is just making another int at the end, but if this was a vector of thread pools, you just kicked off 10,000 threads, which is probably not what you wanted to do. So for types that have more, a more complicated logic in their constructions, you should prefer pushback unless there's a real reason to use in placeback for performance or anything like that. Tip the 122nd. Test fixtures, clarity, and data flow. So great. I wrote a test for my thing, check it out. It's Socrates, and what does that even do? Do it? How is that a useful name? It's simple, look, it's just, it's in both of the tests, and so I just made a little helper function, got rid of the boilerplate, it's so much better. While the boilerplate seems compelling, what would it look like if you returned the result explicitly? After all, result is appearing out of nowhere, it's a bit magical, and you could save a line in the fixture. No, you senior philosophers are never happy with code that just works. How's that? Seems like a step in the right direction, but. The, those expected variables are only used once. And they're also a bit magical. What if we inline those too? I could be writing real code here. Tests are real code. In some ways, they're even more dangerous because tests themselves aren't tested. They have to be correct from inspection. 
I just noticed that your configure methods are only called once. Maybe they could be in line two? All right, all right, fine, but during chem login day. That's great, but I forgot what do it does. Scrolling is hard for us old farts. Maybe you could inline it? I vaguely recall it but isn't that. My super brain's IDE has mouse over function definitions, little window tooltip. You expect me to code in anything other than Vim, a magnifying glass, and a steady hand? <laughs> Fine. Like, look how terrible this is. This is, this is awful. It's so much worse. Uh, at least we both agree that it's ugly now. It was ugly before, but at least now you can see it. <laughs> All these things are locals. Why don't they keep their types with them? Oh, uh, uh, okay, okay. I think I see the gymnastics you're getting at here. So I'm gonna do this. And then you're gonna tell me to inline example A. Ordinarily, I ask the leading questions, but yes. All right, fine. Have you now? I'm not sure if you've heard the saying, but I am far too smart to be happy. Besides, it looks like Frobber could easily be stack allocated and result doesn't do anything. <sighs> anything else you want? Well, your test fixture is empty now too, but I can see why you wanted to avoid boilerplate with your original helpers. Just, are you gonna approve my change now? Happily. Um, so that's what we got. Thank you guys for coming so much. Uh, you can go see a lot more of these Absale Tip of the Week. They're all just really short little articles with practical day-to-day -day readability and maintainability tips. There's tons of them. This was just a very small hint. Um, and to get to the Tip of the Week number blah, then it's absale.io slash tips slash blah. Um, so on that note, any questions? Feel free to ask about other tips, although if you cite it by number, we'll ask you to tell us the title. Yep. <laughs> yeah, uh, can I go back one slide? Yeah. Uh, one slide back to like the last test picture, basically. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yeah. Uh, oh. Test F, Mind. test. In, in GUnit, uh, you can have a fixture that has set up and tear down methods, and when you do that, you use test F. And when you don't have all those set up and tear down methods because you've extracted all the boilerplate for the true essence of your test, then you can just use the test directly. Yeah, I, I misread the slide initially. I thought the um, constructor argument and the string in the expect equal cross would be the same. If it were, would you consider making that a constant or would you still prefer? Can you speak more into the mic? I'm having trouble oh, hearing sorry. you. Um, I misremembered the slide, and I thought the constructor argument and the string in the expect equals clause would be the same. I now see that it's example versus expected. If it was the same string, would you consider like making a name constant for that, or is that usually better to? I'd go 50-50 on it. It depends how long the string is. Yeah. The, whole, the whole point of that tip is that tests, like call site readability matters more for tests because the tests aren't tested, so it's better to be more verbose and do less initialization, and sometimes it just ends up leading to a more readable and better looking test anyways. In particular, the data in your test should just sort of flow linearly so you can follow it. When you have a test fixture where people are grabbing into random parts in the middle, it can be very, very hard to follow what is going on. Uh, the question is, are the tips for related to the test somehow related to Google's testing on the toilet thing? Um, and the answer is no, those are independent efforts. I think this, didn't this one get turned into a testing on the toilet? May have. I've seen there it. is some cross-pollination between them, but testing on the toilet tries to be more language neutral, where the tip of the week is unabashedly about C++. All right, this robe is super hot. <laughs> Thank you.